open your Bibles to the Great Commission, Matthew 28. We'll start there tonight as we continue looking at divine sovereignty and how it impacts our evangelism. I told you last week we were going to take two sections, or really two chapters or lectures out of Packer's book on evangelism and the sovereignty of God, and this is the second one. I think it's the final chapter of the book, Divine Sovereignty and Evangelism. So we considered last week how divine sovereignty affects uh, or how we understand it relative to human responsibility, and we see that both are true. They are both truths uh, given to us even by God himself in Scripture and several passages of Scripture. We looked at Acts 2 and Acts 4 in particular at Christ, uh, Christ's crucifixion and seeing that divine sovereignty and human responsibility go side by side. We're not to pit them against each other in any way. And the same thing goes for, for this lesson, God being sovereign. A couple of questions we have to ask is, how does that affect our evangelism? And uh, Packer does a great job of saying, basically, there's two ways to answer that, negatively and positively. And I think he has some good points to make. But look at the top of your notes there, just to lay a little bit of groundwork and remind you of where we are, what we've learned so far in the first three lessons about this uh, task and duty, responsibility and privilege of evangelism. First of all, evangelism is a task appointed to all God's people everywhere. Now, primarily, we've learned, you can, and uh, we see it in Ephesians 4 in particular, and also Romans 10. Remember, the primary means of evangelism and proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ is through the preaching of the gospel. So the minister then becomes the primary evangelist. Uh, but that doesn't annul the fact or take away from the, from the people to each ourselves be evangelists. We're all responsible and given opportunities, many divine appointments, to share the gospel with our family, our friends, our co-workers, in whatever spheres we find ourselves. That doesn't take away from that. So although there may be a primary emphasis in that regard on the means of grace and preaching in particular, uh, especially drawn out in the epistles, we're still reminded that we each have this task and responsibility as God prepares uh, situations for us. So evangelism is a task appointed to all God's people everywhere. Secondly, it's the task of communicating a message from the Creator to rebel mankind. Right? We're heralds, we're ambassadors, not in a ministerial sense, but in an evangelistic sense. We're delivering a message from the Creator to mankind, which stands in, a, in, in the disposition of rebellion. Thirdly, let us see, the message begins with information and ends with an invitation. Now, we said last time we have to take the long view in evangelism, particularly when we're building relationships. Very important. We're not always going to be able to move the conversation within five to ten minutes to an invitation. It may take a series of visits, a series of conversations. But the idea is we're communicating information, the information that God has given us in his word about man, about sin, about God, about Christ, and communicating that in a way that has an eye toward and an aim toward an invitation, all right? A call to repent and believe, particularly maybe a call to... Uh, to attend the church, to come and on the Lord's Day and sit with God's people in God's house and sit under the means of grace. But that's, that's really the, what we're eyeing. Letter D, taking these two apart now, the information concerns God's work of making His Son a perfect Savior for sinners. That's the good news that we're sharing. The invitation is God's summons, right? Remember that. Again, we're herald, heralds and ambassadors. We're bringing God's message and God's invitation to bear upon people. And let's not forget, letter F, God commands. It's not just an invitation. It is, come if you will, come whosoever. But we need to remember that God commands. Right? God has taken, Christ has taken his throne. And God commands because the judge has been raised from the dead. The judge has been seated in the heavens and will one day be sent in judgment. And therefore, God commands all men everywhere to repent. And he promises forgiveness and restoration to all who do. And then, of course, the Christian is sent into the world to evangelize with this message. It's our duty, and it's our privilege. So it's not something we should, we should do begrudgingly. It's something that we should joy in doing, although with fear of man, it's a real struggle. It's a struggle to bring up the gospel in particular contexts. We get embarrassed. We get afraid. All sorts of fears um, surround us. But we need to push through these by God's grace. And remember, with all the equipping he gives us and all of the things that we're putting in place as far as presuppositions and biblical foundations to really strengthen and enable us to be bold with the gospel. Not in a rude, mean sense, uh, but in, a, in a, uh, a sense that's confident in the message that we share and in man's need for that message. So note Roman numeral two now. How is all of this affected by our belief in God's sovereignty? 
So supposing what we know to be the case, supposing that all things do in fact happen under the direct dominion of God, and that God has already fixed the future by his decree, that God has already resolved whom he will save and whom he will not save, how does this bear on our duty to evangelize? And again, we can answer that negatively and positively. So to begin with a negative response, the sovereignty of God, says Packer, the sovereignty of God in grace doesn't affect anything that we know about the nature and duty of evangelism. Right? It doesn't affect anything that we know about the nature and duty to evangelism. Evangelism is still a task given to the church. It's still a duty before us as God's people and certainly before the minister preaching the gospel and evangelizing from the pulpit. In other words, the rule of our duty and the measure of our responsibility is God's revealed will of command and not his secret will of degree. Right? We don't evangelize with a knowledge of his election. We know God has an elect people, but we're not governed by that in our evangelism because as Packer will later say, and I think it's a helpful way to put it, right? the elect are faceless people. We don't know who they are. right? They're faceless people. And so we're not governed by that. But what we are governed by is the Great Commission. And so Christ gives this to us. And again, Christ is speaking particularly to his disciples. And he says relative to that, that he will be with us to the end of the age. And therefore, he will be with a proclamation of the gospel unto the end of the age. But there's still something in here that bears upon us all. Not just ministers, right? But bears upon us all. And so verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Turn to Deuteronomy 29, 29, well-known verse, about the secrets that belong to God. But we forget the other half of this verse, that those things God has revealed to us are in order that we might be obedient to those things. So Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. That's typically the, the, the half that gets quoted. But look at the other half. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. So what a great verse that brings these two facts together. The secret things belong to God. Only God knows his elect. But that which has been revealed to us, which in this case is the duty and the task of evangelism... That's been revealed to us that we might be obedient to it, right? He didn't tell the disciples, go evangelize the elect. He said to go into all the world. In fact, in Mark 16, he says, go and bring the gospel to every creature, right? Go and evangelize. Go into all nations. Thinking of what we heard this morning from Acts chapter 2, right? The gospel going forth now in the languages throughout the world. All the then known world is covered and turned upside down by the preaching of the gospel. Go everywhere to everyone as God gives us opportunity, because all men stand in need of the gospel. And so this first point then, the sovereignty of God in grace does not affect anything that we know about the nature and duty of evangelism. And he gives four examples, and we'll walk through these now. Number one, the belief that God is sovereign in grace does not affect the necessity of evangelism. Just because God is sovereign and he has determined all things, decreed all things, doesn't remove the necessity for this task. So that whatever we may believe about election, whether we believe in it or not, doesn't matter. Evangelism is necessary because no man can be saved without the gospel. Again, turn to Paul's famous passage in Romans 10. It's a series of inferences going from one point to the next that climaxes in the reality that this is how God brings the gospel to his elect. It's how God brings the gospel to the world, but particularly it's how he brings the gospel to his elect through this very means. So even if just for the sake of the elect we need to evangelize, but because we don't know who they are, Paul says, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. To the Jew I become a Jew, to the Greek a Greek, in order that I might bring the gospel in every context possible, every open door given to me, preach the gospel so that the elect might be saved. That's really what's driving us, as we'll see in a moment when we look at it positively. It's God's sovereignty and election that actually motivates our evangelism. Because we know they're out there, and they're going to hear, and they're going to answer. So Romans 10, Paul gives us these, this unfolding, beginning in verse 14. How then will they call upon him in whom they have never, not believed? 
And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Now verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So that's the progression. That's the unfolding. We're going to get the word of the gospel out. We've got to go. They need to believe in order to be saved, but in order for them to believe, we have to go with that message primarily as in terms of a herald, primarily by preaching, but also in the breadth of the church by evangelism. And so the fact that God is sovereign and believing in God's sovereignty, evangelism in a reformed circle, evangelism according to a reformed understanding of the, of the scriptures doesn't remove the necessity. It actually provides the enabling for it, as we'll see in a moment. And so God's way of saving his elect is by bringing them to faith in the gospel of the Savior. Remember what Paul says in Romans 1, right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And Paul goes forth to that end, right? that the elect might hear the gospel, that the gospel might come to the world. But look at Romans 3. Again, God's sovereignty does not remove or affect the necessity of evangelism. And it's interesting that in Romans 3, it's God who puts Christ forth for an evangelistic purpose. Romans 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God puts forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. How are they going to receive it by faith? They have to hear the message preached. And in order that that happens, God puts Christ forward. How does God put Christ forward? Through the preaching of the gospel, through evangelism, through appointed heralds and messengers to take that gospel forth, that they might believe and through faith come unto Christ and come through the gospel. And again, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. So evangelism, put it this way, letter A, evangelism is the appointed means for, for which we're responsible to the decreed end for which God is responsible. I think that's just a great way to understand that, right? It brings both of those together. Evangelism, evangelism is the means for which we are responsible to the end for which God is responsible because it's the means to bring his elect to himself. And we see this right in the parable that Christ tells. Goes to Matthew, go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verses 1 to 10, the parable of the wedding feast. The image here that Christ gives is the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So we should automatically be thinking in the context, it's, it's God the Father giving a wedding feast for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what Jesus is saying. And notice how the story unfolds. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants, now you think of the prophets, the apostles, etc., to call those who were invited, particularly the Jews, beginning with the Jews, to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent others. He sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, like remind them, go back to them again. See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers <coughs> and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now your Bibles are open. That's 22, 1 to 10. Look back at 21, 33 to 43. That's a parable of the wicked tenants we read a reference this morning. Right? Notice how these two are come together. Remember the chapters, chapter and verse divisions are created later, not by Matthew. And so right after this testimony that Christ gives, right, right after Matthew reminding us of this parable of the, of the tenants and that the vineyard is going to be taken away from the wicked tenants who do not bring forth fruit and given to other tenants, the Gentiles, who will bring forth fruit, moves right then into the wedding feast. Those for whom the wedding feast was prepared, the Jews, 
They refuse to come. So what does he do? He sends servants out. Go into the highways, the byways, the streets, and gather whomever you can find and bring them all in. That's the Gentiles. So this, and how, how are the Gentiles brought in? Through evangelism. Again, primarily an apostolic mission at first, but then, of course, extended unto the church of all ages after that foundation is laid. And so evangelism is that appointed means to the decreed end of the salvation of the elect. What a motivation that is. So the belief that God is sovereign in grace does not affect the necessity of evangelism. Secondly, the belief that God is sovereign in grace does not affect the urgency of evangelism because Christ says it simply, men without Christ are lost and they're going to hell. Luke 13, 3, Luke 13, 5. I tell you the truth, if you do not repent, you will perish. So we should never be held back by the fact that if they're not elect, they won't believe. Right? That's true. But that's none of our business, and that should not influence our actions. Again, here's where Packer says, the elect are faceless men. We don't know who they are. It's impossible to know as we minister to the lost whether they are an elect or not. But we're called to love, not the elect, but our neighbor. And for the sake of our love for our neighbor, bring the gospel as God enables and out of love for them, we should tell them of Christ. And again, that door may not open. It may not open easily. It may not open frequently. But as the opportunity arises, if we can make the conversation and move it toward Christ, we'll talk a lot about that as we get to Metzger's book in a few weeks. And that's really our goal. Thirdly, then, the belief that God is sovereign in grace does not affect the genuineness of the gospel invitations or the truth of the gospel promises. We could spend a lot of time here thinking about it. Men have spent a lot of time writing on this topic and wrestling. Right? If God only chose certain people to save, the elect, and certain people, the rest, will not be saved, then how is it that God can make, through his ministers, through anyone, how is it that God can make a genuine, sincere offer of the gospel? Because they're not coming. He knows they're not coming. They're not elect. How can God make a genuine offer, a genuine invitation of the gospel in that sense to all men indiscriminately? But we don't, have to t- we don't have the time to wrestle with that. What we need to remember is God is not insincere. Right? That God in his gospel offer is sincere. And when Christ says, whosoever, that's exactly what he means. Back of that, there's an unwillingness in the hearts of men not to come and an absolute refusal in the hearts of the reprobate to never come. Right? That arises from within themselves. We'll see that in a moment. The next point, actually. Back of that, yes, that's the case. But God is not being insincere when the gospel is offered. Think of how many times we saw it in Hosea. Right? God knew exactly, even as Moses said, when you get into the land, you're going to rebel against God and he's going to kick you out. Moses saw hundreds of years in advance. Right? He knew exactly what would happen because the Lord told him. And yet still there's a genuine offer through the prophet Hosea, repent and the Lord will relent of his judgment. There's still time to turn. Right? And there's a mystery to try to understand that, but that's not, not for us to comprehend. It's for us to accept on the basis of what Scripture tells us. There's a genuineness in the gospel offer to all men indiscriminately, and there's the truth of the gospel promises held out to all men indiscriminately. You come, even you, and you will be welcome, whoever you are from wherever you come, regardless of what you are, what you've done, come, and the promise is yours. So God sincerely offers Christ, and he promises justification in life to whosoever will repent and believe. So the invitation is for sinners universally, all who here may come. And Christ says this. Think of Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come, all, what? Who are weary and heavy laden? Right? If you're weary and heavy laden, Come. You can come and you will come if the Holy Spirit has begun that work. They will indeed come. The reason others don't come is in themselves. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten that whosoever will whosoever will believe on him has eternal life and shall not come into condemnation. Turn to 1 Timothy 1.15 and 16 in the midst of Paul's own reflections upon his own salvation. God's grace to him, how undeserving he was. The chief of sinners, and yet Paul tells us clearly, 
We don't need to dabble into all the mysteries of how this all works. What we need to do is accept the truth of Scripture. And Paul says in verse 15, 1 Timothy 1, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Period. That's it. If you're a sinner, Christ Jesus came into the world for the salvation of sinners. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And that's what we're working with. Right? That's the ground we have. Again, 1 John chapter 2, right? 1 John chapter 2. My children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And then verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Not for all men without exception, right? But for all men without distinction. Not just for the Jews, not just for the Greeks, not just for the slave, not just for the free, male, female. Everyone without distinction can come. And obviously God has to work in the drawing of the heart. Turn in your hymnals to Confession chapter 7, back of your hymnal. Westminster Confession chapter 7 on God's covenant with man. I love this paragraph. This paragraph jumped out at, uh, out at me years ago. And just a wonderful summary of the gospel right here. Paragraph 7, or excuse me, chapter 7, paragraph 3. Man by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant, the covenant of works, the Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace. Wherein he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved. That's the demand. That's the command. Repent and believe. Requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved. But now here's the other part of it. And promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. You see both of these together, right? There's the command, the call to believe, the call to repent, and here's the fullness of the gospel. Here's where God gets all of the glory. So the responsibility is on man to come. And again, whosoever will may come. But the glory of the gospel is that God gets all the glory because he sends his spirit into the heart to open the door that we might receive the gospel, that we might receive Christ. So letter B, 3B, it is true that the Father has from all eternity elected whom he will save. It's true that Christ came only to, to save, to die for the elect. And it's true that the Holy Spirit goes forth to open the ears and enable the elect to come and be saved. So you got the, the triune work there, right? The Trinity is in full agreement that it is the elect that have been chosen, that have been redeemed by the work of Christ, and now regenerated by the work of the Spirit. But it's also true that the free offer of the gospel by God to all men is sincere and holds forth a true promise that whosoever will may come and that all who come will be received. Right? Think of how, how strong the language is in Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, very strong language where the Lord makes clear to us in this context, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are so much higher. Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked, notice these strong designations, let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God isn't calling the, the minimally wicked, right? He's calling the wicked, the unrighteous, the worst of the worst. As Paul would say, he's calling the chief of sinners. And he says here to the chief of sinners, you, repent. Seek the Lord, because he abundantly pardons. That's the promise that's held forth. They will or will not come according to their own desires, and back of that, according to God's gracious work and his elect. But the promise is held out, it's sincere, and the Lord is not false in his offer of salvation. John 6, you remember that context. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And this is what the Old Testament promises. Everyone who, who is taught of God will come. You have to be taught of God, which is a work of the Spirit. And you remember Ezekiel chapter 18. I'll just read the last couple of verses here, but verses 25 to 32. 
Ezekiel 18, beginning in verse 30, the Lord says to Israel, who accuses God of being unjust, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. How would they be ruined? Their ruin is grounded and founded upon their own sin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Now, they can't do that, but that's still the command. Just as, though the, just as, as much as the command to repent and believe is given to mankind, they need God's grace to do that. But the command is upon them and given to them because our inability, remember, is our own fault, right, in the fall. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. Again, a genuine offer, a sincere call to all who will hear to come. So these truths, as we saw last time, same here. These truths stand side by side in Scripture, and that's where they belong. They go together. They walk hand in hand. God sends forth his ambassadors with the gospel to bring good news unto the world. And what is the cry? Be reconciled to God while there is still time. When is that time? What is the time frame? Today. Today the call is made. Today the door is open. Tomorrow it may be shut. But today it's open. So third thing there then, the belief that God is sovereign does not affect the genuineness of the gospel invitations or the truth of the gospel promises. We are sincere in our offer and we preach and declare that and proclaim that boldly. The door is open. Even you, yes you, may come. That's the message. Fourthly then, the finally, under this negative way of looking at or answering it, the belief that God is sovereign in grace does not affect the responsibility of the sinner for his reaction to the gospel. So this is the other side we were just talking about. A man who rejects Christ becomes the cause of his own condemnation. It's, we find this right in John chapter 3, for one instance. John 3 verse 18, and then at the end of the chapter, verse 36, verse 18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. That's the promise. But here's the other fact of that reality. Whoever does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So where's the onus? Where's the burden? The guilt? It's upon the one who does not believe. And then verse 36 at the end, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. What, is, what does it mean to obey the Son in that context? What does the Son call you to do, right? What is the call of the gospel? Repent and believe. And if we refuse that, then our burden rests with ourselves. And so unbelievers can't excuse themselves by saying that they were not elect. That has no bearing on their present responsibility to believe the gospel which God brings to them. So turn to Luke 10. Luke 10, verse 13. Again, Christ sends out to here in this case. This is the only, Luke is the only gospel that uh, we see the sending out of the 72 here in Luke 10. He sends them out as evangelists and they go forth and they're told to preach that the kingdom of God has come near to you. And he speaks of those who will welcome them, bring peace to them. But if those, for those who reject you, he says to them, Jesus says to them, wipe the dust off your feet. Nevertheless, know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. And then he goes on to pronounce his woes. Woe to you, verse 13. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. Turn to Luke 13, verse 34. That is not the right verse. Yes, it is. Sorry, I was looking at 1234. So 1334, Christ says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. Think of what we heard in the sermon this morning at the day of Pentecost, God's judgment on unrepentant Israel. So this doesn't take away the unbeliever's responsibility for his actions. The unbeliever, letter B, the unbeliever is forced to acknowledge that he and no one but he is responsible for his willful rejection of the Christ preached to him. 
Turn to John 5. John 5. Remember in verse 39, you'll, you'll recognize verse 39 of John 5. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. But look at verse 40. Jesus says here to the Pharisees, Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. They're blinded. Right? They're in bondage to sin, etc., etc., etc. But there's a refusal that Christ points at. You refuse to come to me. Right? You rejected John the Baptist, and now you're rejecting me. Right? You rejected him, you reject me, it's your refusal. They're responsible. Right? The unbeliever, think of this unbeliever who refuses to come. So under letter B, he could have come, he could have believed, he could have left his sins, he could have fled to Christ, but he did not because he would not. He did not because he didn't want to. His own heart knows it to be so. Go to Proverbs chapter 5. Look at how Solomon describes the situation of the wanderer into sin and the choices that he is making. Of course, he's warning his son not to make such choices. But look at the, look at the destruction that comes to those who wander into the way of adultery, which, of course, in Proverbs, remember, is idolatry, right? Lady Folly, the adulteress, this is all just idolatry. It's all the idolatry that we saw take place in the land uh, when we went through Hosea. That's really what's behind all of this, of course. But notice, not only the judgment or the, the destruction that comes upon this man because of his choices, but notice his reflections at the end. Because at the end, he's stuck with the fact that he made these choices. Verse 7, Solomon says, And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed and you say to yourself, How I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation." You see the reflections at the end of it all? I did not heed discipline. I hated reproof. I turned out of the way. I made these choices. That's what the unbeliever is left with at the end of the day. The reason he did not come to Christ is because he did not want to come to Christ. He refused to come to Christ. So back of that, yes, there's election, there's sovereignty, there's the decree, but that doesn't govern our evangelism, and no one can use that as an excuse at the end day. Well, I wasn't elect. It's your fault, God. You remember how Paul responds to that in Romans 9? Who are you to reply against God? Yes, there's a sovereign election, but you are accountable for your choices. When the gospel comes to you, and you can hear and understand it, you're responsible for your response to it. So whether, ele whether or not he is elect has no bearing at all on what he knows of his own free decision in the matter. He rejected the gospel, and he now must endure the consequences of his rejection. So the Bible never says sinners miss heaven because they're not elect. That is a truth, but that's not how the Bible presents that. The Bible makes very clear that sinners miss heaven, and they perish because they refuse to repent and believe. That's, what the Bible, that's where the Bible puts the responsibility and the onus again. Repent or you will perish. You refuse to come to me. And then, of course, Romans 3. There's no fear of God before their eyes. The responsibility is ours. So negatively then, how did we answer this? Negatively, the sovereignty of God and grace does not affect anything that we know about the nature and duty of evangelism. But let's answer that now positively. Letters B and C is the positive response. First of all, as I said earlier, the sovereignty of God in grace gives us our only hope of success in evangelism. This is what compels and motivates us. This takes us back to the Great Commission. Go, therefore, upon what ground? Because all authority in heaven and on earth has been granted to me. Go with confidence. Go with boldness. Be courageous. Look at the disciples. Think of Acts 4, right? Acts 4, when they came back from being rebuked and, and told no, to preach no more in that name. And they came back and rejoiced. And they were given even more boldness as the Holy Spirit filled the house and gave them boldness again to go forth unafraid. On what ground? Christ is on the throne. 
right? You judge for yourself whether it is right to obey God or you. And if God sends us forth, we cannot, the apostles say, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We have to, ta- have to tell these things. We have to bring the gospel forth. It's our, the, the hope of our success in evangelism is because God, Christ, has ascended to the throne. Jesus has ascended to the throne as Lord and Christ. The sovereignty of God, so far from making evangelism pointless, the sovereignty of God is the one thing that present, that prevents evangelism from being pointless. And it creates the possibility, in fact, it creates the certainty that our evangelism will be successful. Not in every instance, maybe not for a long time. You think of how long, how long Jeremiah preached without a convert, Isaiah. Hosea didn't look like Hosea was very successful at all in his ministry. He continued to groan throughout his ministry at the rebellion of God's people. That doesn't take away the fact that God is sovereign, the gospel is sufficient, man needs it, and therefore we need to proclaim it. Let her see, were it not for God's sovereignty, evangelism would be the most futile and useless enterprise the world has ever seen. It would be a complete waste of time. First of all, because of the spiritual inability of man, who is responsible to repent and believe, and yet in himself can't repent and believe. And secondly, because of Satan's work in the children of disobedience. Right? Remember what we learned from Luke 11. Who lives in the heart of every unbeliever? The devil. He's on the throne. That's his kingdom. All his goods are safe. Right? He's the strong man. And, the, and Paul speaks of the unbeliever, right? Being subject to his will. Held captive. He's got the throne. So unless someone stronger than he can expel him and plunder his goods, he's not going anywhere. Right? But the beauty of the gospel, as we've seen already, is that Christ comes by his spirit and he expels the strong man because he is stronger than he and he plunders his goods. He takes that soul, he takes that life, and he saves another sinner and rescues another sinner, rescues, in fact, the very elect of God. So in face of these two insurmountable obstacles, the spiritual inability of man and Satan's work in the children of disobedience, evangelism can't possibly succeed and it is doomed to failure unless God is sovereign. And so God's sovereignty then is the the ground for our hope. The success of evangelism, as we'll come to find later in our study, the success of evangelism will not be found in gimmicks, techniques, or canned prayers but in an utter dependence upon the sovereignty of God and in in the sincere prayer that he who alone can save and who has been pleased to elect a people for salvation, that he would go forth. And this is what we pray for. One of the primary things that we can do in our preparing for evangelism, as we talked about last time, is to pray. We need to be people of prayer that pray. Pray for our missionaries, pray for our evangelists, pray for men and women and heralds who go forth. Pray for the pastor who preaches the gospel. Pray as the word goes forth that the Spirit would accompany it because only he can work in hearts. And that's exactly what he does in the heart of every elect. He brings life, right? And he's a savor of life unto life or death unto death, right? Some are softened while others are hardened. And the Holy Spirit is the one who goes forth to do those tasks. And he does it according to the wisdom and the sovereignty and the grace and the goodness of God. So our calling as evangelist is not that we be successful. We've not been called to be successful. We've been called to be faithful. That's what we need to remember. Faithful to use the means that God has appointed for our task, and that is primarily the means of grace. And as we go forth, the tool that we use is the Word of God. The Scriptures are the tool and the means. So there's no magic in methods, but there's blessing in faithfulness. So let us evangelize with the confidence of those whom, whose God raises the dead by simply saying, come. What an encouragement, right? Think how, how Christ brought Lazarus from the dead. He just said, come, and Lazarus came. And that's the kind of power with which the Spirit goes forth. And that's exactly what we'll see through the book of Acts. The Spirit goes forth, and, the, and those whom God has called, those whom God has ordained to eternal life, they believe. How remarkable that Peter could preach that sermon in 3,000 souls. And a few days later, 5,000 souls come, added to the church by the thousands. Sermons weren't anything amazing. They were the word of God brought forth by the spirit of God, bringing it home to hearts and redeeming a people. That's what he does. So Peter's faithfulness was what was on, on on stage there, if you will. And the Holy Spirit used that to change hearts.
So as we wrap this up then tonight, the last point, how should our belief in God's sovereignty? Right? We've asked, how does God's sovereignty affect our evangelism? Well, it doesn't impact it in any way. We're still, still supposed to go forth in negatively, but positively it gives us our greatest hope of success. So how does it impact our methods, let's say? Well, three things. It should make us bold. It should make us patient. It should make us prayerful. Right? You think of the, you know, the title here tonight, right? God's sovereignty and evangelism. Knowing these two things are so, that God is sovereign and he's given us the task of evangelizing and sharing the gospel. We should be bold, patient, and prayerful. We look at these then, the first of all, bold. We're bold and confident, right? We're not bold and confident because we've got the perfect method and the best approach and we've, we're well studied. No, our confidence is in God. It's in his sovereignty, it's in his grace, it's in his goodness, it's in his spirit. Where We go forth confident in God. We know from what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, no heart is too hard for the grace of God. Paul said, Christ saved me, the chief of sinners, that all men might have hope. And we can persevere, right? We're not on a fool's errand. We're not wasting our time. We're not spinning our wheels. We're doing the very thing that God has commanded us to do, the thing that he has ensured us will be successful <clears throat> in his time and in his manner, according to his will for his church. It will be successful. We don't need to be ashamed of the message we, we share. We don't need to be ashamed of Christ, right? We have confidence. We don't need to be embarrassed. We can be bold, free, natural, and hopeful of success. Why? Because God is sovereign, right? Secondly, it should make us patient. And this is kind of taking the long view, as I said earlier, Right? We get in a hurry with people and situations, but God saves in his own time. Just look back at your own experience. Right? Look back at how long it took you to come to Christ. Right? How long and how patient God was with you to bring you to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God saves in his own time. He's not in a hurry. And we don't know whether we're planting, right? which is early on in the harvesting process, the very beginning. Right? We don't know whether we're planting or watering or whether we might have the actual privilege of harvesting a soul. How often did Paul speak of planting and watering and others had the harvest, right? Paul didn't get to bring the harvest in, but he knew he was laying a foundation for a harvest to come even by others. That's why he said in 1 Timothy, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 3, be careful then how you build upon this foundation. Be careful how you go forth and to gather that harvest in. Build on this foundation and you'll be successful because you'll be faithful to it. But God knows exactly what he's doing and using, using us. God's not frantic. God's not anxious his timing is perfect, and so we need to be patient. Don't give up on people. We're not promised quick results in conversations. We know that. People can be very difficult, especially when we're talking about their souls and we're talking about sin and God and heaven and hell. But we are promised that the Lord's presence will be with us. Acts 28.20, 20, we are promised His goodwill to all men. God's purpose is good and righteous. We know He is doing right. And so we need to seek to, be, to befriend people. And be willing to walk along and go along with people at God's speed. Just be patient with them as you work with them. And sometimes that might seem strangely slow, but the Lord knows exactly what he's doing. That's God's business and not yours, what the speed is like. Our business is simply to keep pace with what God is doing. Be available, be ready, be willing. Have things on the tip of your mind, tip of your tongue, ready when the door opens to share, to speak, to drive the conversation. Turn the conversation to the things that matter, the things of eternity, and be faithful in the role God's given you. So be bold, be patient, and then finally tonight, of course, be prayerful. And as we come to God in prayer, we're acknowledging our inability to save anyone. All right? We're impotent. We can't change hearts. We can't reach in. Sometimes we wish we could, right? especially when people are, when we get into a difficult debate or conversation with someone, trying to persuade and trying to argue and persuade them. Right? We wish we could just turn a flip a switch in their minds and help them to see it correctly. We wish we could reach into their hearts and soften it, change it, but we can't. We can't win a man's soul. None of us can, right? But God can. And so we need to remind the Lord as we go forth and seek to be instruments in his hand, remind him how reliant we are upon him, that we are fully dependent upon him. And as we're learning more and more about the Spirit's work in the church and in, in us as his people, right, be reminded and remind the Lord that you are dependent upon his Holy Spirit, that the Spirit would go forth and change hearts, that the Spirit would open eyes, the Spirit would, would bless you, would, would bring to your mind the, the right things to say, the right responses, the right verses or words, whatever it may be. Sometimes we go into a conversation and we're prepared to say something and then we're in the middle of it, something else comes to mind, 
And we realize we should say that instead. Whatever we prepared goes out the window. But we're being sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding. We're listening. And we're trying to respond particularly and specifically to a person's need and a person's life. And so pray for the Spirit to go ahead of us. And so we, we pray, we witness, we pray, we hope, because God is sovereign and that's our confidence. So we have a wonderful foundation upon which we can stand, right? Again, you see how, how our theology grounds our methodology, right? Our doctrine grounds our practice. We do things a certain way because we're trying to do things biblically. And when we stand upon the testimony of Scripture, what an encouragement, what a boldness, right, we can have and what confidence we can have. Uh, the Lord's going to be faithful to his people. So I hope that encourages you as we wrap that up then from Packer on God's sovereignty. And I've asked David Kenner to order a few of these books because I know several of you haven't read it, but I hope that he can get some at a good price for you. That you can, I highly recommend you, you read uh, Packer's book. Maybe we'll put one in the library too. So, All right, well, amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless what we've learned tonight. Father, we desire, as we continue through this study, we desire to acknowledge that we are instruments in your hand. We desire to be tools that you might use, Father, for the bringing of grace and salvation to sinners. We think of so many sinners in our lives, Lord, family members who are yet lost, friends and acquaintances, people whom we have come to love and get close to, and yet they're lost, neighbors and acquaintances and co-workers whom we just wish were saved and knew Christ and had the, the confidence and the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus, and yet they do not. So many people, Lord, faces and names that run through our minds even now, Lord, we want to be tools in your hand for the salvation of these whom we know and love. We pray that the love you have poured into our hearts may be graciously given to them as well. And we know you can do this sovereignly. You can do this, Lord, without any help from us. You don't need us. And yet, what a wonderful privilege to be involved in the saving of souls, the bringing of men and women and boys and girls to the knowledge of Christ, seeing the opening of the eyes of the blind. We pray, Father, that you would help us to, to catch the vision of the spreading of the kingdom of Christ that we would seek to be used by you, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel. We would not be embarrassed to speak of our faith, to speak of Jesus or our church or the Bible, but that we would speak of these things, uh, Lord, with a sense of confidence, but also joy. For the world struggles, Lord. Oh, we're surrounded by people who have no joy. They have no foundation. They have no solidity in their lives. Everything is chaos and upheaval, and they have no solid footing. And yet we do. And so we pray, Lord, that as we share these things with those around us, Lord, and as we speak and live our lives, that it might be evident that we have a sure hope, a steadfast hope. And so we pray, Father, that you would help us uh, to be used of you for the salvation of the lost. Grant to us, O oh Lord, a blessing as we continue this study, particularly as we dig into Will Metzger's book, Lord, that is so very helpful and practical. We pray that it would be a wonderful learning opportunity for us and that we would feel ourselves being equipped and enabled, Lord, to, uh, to go forth in this task. Bless our church, we pray. Be with our, our members. Watch over them, one and all. We ask that you would draw near to them and bless them this night. Be with us all as we go into this week. We pray for your help, that the task and the duties before us, O oh Lord, we would be faithful in them, that you might be glorified in all of us and all the things that we do this week, that we might be faithful to our calling and our vocation, seeking to be a people who live out their faith in this world, people who shine as a light upon a hill for the good things of God, and let the world see our good works and bring glory to our Father who is in heaven. And so we commit ourselves now to you, and we do so with confidence and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.